Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patricia Borger, Vice Chancellor of Development and Alumni Relations at UWM. It's my great pleasure to welcome so many UWM faculty and staff, along with corporate and community leaders to today's conversation. We are very honored that our distinguished alumnus, Michael Fenlon, is joining us along with some guests today for a conversation that matters to all of us, creating the workforce of the future in a just and inclusive workplace. If you have any questions throughout the program, please enter them into the chat and we will answer as many as we can as time permits following the, the presentation. Now I invite our chancellor, Mark Money, to come to the screen. Well, thank you, Pat. And good <laughs> afternoon, everyone. I'm just thrilled to have you all joining us for such a special event. You know, I've been excited since we put this on the calendar and I have to tell you when Pat Borger and I met Mike Fenlon in New York a few years ago, I was blown away. What a star alumnus he is. Uh, we're just so thrilled, Mike, that you and your colleagues from PricewaterhouseCooper can join us uh, today to talk about the future of work and um, uh, developing the workforce of the future. Uh, your reputation is stellar, and I know we're going to learn a tremendous amount. So that everybody knows, um, Mike earned a degree in 1986 from UW-Milwaukee in comparative religion. Sometimes people might say in any particular area, in any particular degree field, well, what can you do with that? Well, let me tell you what Mike Finlan did with that. He went on to Columbia and he earned three master's degrees and a PhD. He became a psychologist. He specializes today in strategic and organizational change, talent management and leadership development. He was a faculty member at Columbia University in their business school and he served as their associate dean for the executive MBA program. He had a series of executive MBA programs and he helped bring them to number one standing in the field. Uh, with that in my background, uh, Mike, I just stand back and I'm in awe of, of uh, what you've did and, and, and how long you've been able to uh, achieve such high levels of success. He then joined PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, he's uh, continued his expertise in strategic and organizational practice and today is the chief people officer for PricewaterhouseCoopers, which has 276,000 employees in 157 countries in the world. That's just about all the countries. So uh, they truly have a global presence. Those companies serve millions of uh, uh, employees through their work in terms of the client firms of PwC. Uh, so it's pretty impressive impact uh, that those more than quarter million employees of PricewaterhouseCoopers have. In 2016, Fast Company named Mike one of the most, in, among the 100 most creative people in business and he specializes in finding creative solutions to complex problems. That's really one of his strengths. But as I stand back and I think about the roots um, and, and I, I suspect and imagine that during the course of our conversation today, Mike might talk about this, but I see five core strengths and five core really platform things that, that Mike seems to stand for. And I think that it does come from the value of having um, the liberal arts, humanities, social sciences framework and starting point um, that, that ultimately has shaped a lot of his work. They include um, inclusive leadership. Second, talent acquisition and diversity in, in terms of, of thinking about how do we, how do we build a modern uh, technology enabled um, people function in organizations going on? How do we think about the innovations that are necessary in higher ed? Huge implications for us. Um, and of course, the responsibility of the business community, and I would add the higher ed community, to build an inclusive and sustainable economy and society. Um, this is uh, some of the critical um, themes that, that pervade uh, Mike's work and everything that he does. So I think a lot of this is, is, is really built on and rooted in, in a lot of the things that start uh, in those formative years. So recently, Mike wrote a co he co-wrote a white paper about business and higher education working together in innovative ways, building the vibrant workforce, but also with a strong equity lens. What could be more important? So I could go on, I could elaborate at length, but you know, we have this special opportunity to hear from Mike and his colleagues. So Mike, please take it away and welcome and thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh very much, Mark, for those very kind words. Uh, 
and I, I certainly feel extraordinarily fortunate uh, to have been educated at UWM and uh, all, all the opportunities that it has uh, really the foundation and of my education and, and the opportunities I've been able to, uh, to get. I certainly feel very privileged in that way. So, so again, thank you for those kind words. And I'm really excited to, uh, to join you and everyone today for some dialogue. Uh, if we could, I want to introduce some colleagues of mine as well. So if we could go to um, the, uh, we have a short, uh, our discussion here, and then I know we'll open it up uh, for, uh, for some questions and dialogue. So if we could just go to the, the next slide, please. So I'm delighted to uh, have with me today two colleagues, uh, Trelisa King, who's a director in our firm and is based in the great city of Atlanta, and uh, Scott Grossnickel, uh, who uh, along with me is based in New York. Scott is a manager. And both Trelisa and, and Scott have a role in our firm we call Digital Accelerator, in addition to their business responsibilities, uh, their other roles. And we're going to uh, use PwC in a sense as a case study today <clears throat> to share with you our journey, some of the things we're learning. And, I, and I'm hoping we'll be relevant and of interest both to educators as well as uh, the business community that's joined us here, here today. So, uh, so thank you. So why don't we go to the next slide? We're gonna broaden the aperture uh, for just a moment, as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, recently I uh, co-wrote a, a paper with Brian Fitzgerald, who's CEO of the Business Higher Education Forum, and, and the team at BHEF have been a, just a fantastic, uh, it's been a fantastic collaboration for us. Um, one of the things we did with the paper on uh, workforce of the future today is, is to frame it broadly in the uh, in the world we're in, the trends that we see that are transforming our society, transforming really our, our lives. And today, as much as we're focusing uh, on digital transformation of business, upskilling of our, of our workforces, uh, the, the imperative of that in our, in our society, and building an inclusive economy, um, so diversity and, and inclusion is a, is a thread here as well that we're going to pick up on. I, I did want to take a moment just to anchor, anchor our discussion in this framework. By the way, this framework came from our PwC strategy team, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Blair Shepard, who, by the way, similarly, Mark, he, he was uh, dean at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke uh, before he joined our firm, uh, leads our strategy work and uh, develop this, this framework. Now, I'm not gonna go through each of these, by the way, our paper summarizes a lot of the work uh, here. Many of these are quite familiar to us, uh, but let me start with a, a very short quote from uh, the first economist, Jan Tinbergen, who the first economist to win the Nobel Prize, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, that inequality is a race between technological progress and education. And certainly today, as we think about the forces that are uh, shaping our society, many people feel left behind. Uh, many people across the world are being left behind as we talk about this digital divide uh, in, in our society on many different levels. So we certainly believe it's an imperative. What can we do as, as business leaders, not simply to transform our business, but to support uh, the, build, the development of an inclusive economy, an inclusive society. We, we certainly think that's an imperative. And we've seen a sharper focus on purpose uh, within the business community, really over the past few years. Uh, you saw that, for example, in the business roundtable, the BRT, the work they've done on purpose. And, and many CEOs now uh, uh, focused on broader the, the broader commitment we have to society and, and to stakeholders. So um, these, these, um, these forces, if you will, these factors of change ranging from wealth inequality, obviously the pervasive nature of uh, technology, as we say on the slide, we're gonna focus on that today. Demographic changes, polarization, the, redu the trust itself uh, and uh, as measured, for example, by the Edelman survey, um, 
uh, very low on, on many fronts. Uh, interestingly, business leaders uh, as an institution emerge strong on a relative basis, which, which I think is an interesting which is an interesting finding from their survey. So, so if we go to the next slide, and uh, we're, we're going to now focus a bit more, as I say, around digital transformation. And it was funny, I, just this morning, I happened to get an email from a, an old friend, a colleague of mine, former colleague of mine at, at Columbia Business School, Rita McGrath, who teaches strategy. She publishes a newsletter. And uh, the, the title of her newsletter this morning from Rita was, Your Business is Already in Trouble, you just haven't noticed it yet. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's an appropriate uh, a quote here. So many, it, it's almost impossible to speak to a CEO today who's not talking about digital transformation, business transformation of, of some sort. Obviously, as we continue to navigate the pandemic, uh, many, many of us in business today are also trying to reimagine the workplace itself as we, as we envision returning uh, post-pandemic. But if, if that's limited to, um, you know, fortifying our ability to use our facility, our agility with, with video conferencing technology, obviously that's really not the point here. That technology is transforming our society, this fourth industrial revolution, globalization. These are forces that are, uh, that are transforming our society and, and business itself. We're confronted with many new entrants, uh, shorter lifespans of companies in business than ever before. You see that in the S&P indexes, for example. And, and then for the workforce itself, as I said, so many today are concerned, uh, understandably, about being left behind. And so it, it sharpens then a, a set of questions for us as business leaders. How do we ensure we don't leave anyone behind? Uh, how do we create an inclusive culture uh, that enables our people to remain relevant, to future-proof their skill set, to engage in, uh, to truly engage in lifelong learning. And, and what does it mean for, for educators uh, in terms of how we have to evolve the pathways, some of the traditional pathways to earning uh, not just degrees, but credentials that, that open doors so, and create opportunities? So if we could go to the, the next slide. Thank you. You know, this, this point on pathways, I think, is a, is a significant one. Um, one of the trends we see in the United States, of course, is the student debt crisis. Interestingly enough, the PwC, we introduced a new, a new benefit a number of years ago at the time. Um, I think we were the first large company to do, it, to do it. It was a student loan pay down benefit. And it got a lot of attention. Uh, we hire in the U.S thousands of students every every year, thousands of interns, and that was a trend we were seeing um, uh, probably not five years ago that that suddenly it, we were imagining benefits that we never had before. Similarly, we're, we're looking at what are, what are the new pathways um, that that debt crisis has made it harder and harder for students to pursue um, particularly, by the way, students of color who, who have disproportionate debt load and whose families have disproportionate um, uh, debt, student debt, much harder for them to manage that uh, when you tie it back to that theme around inequality as well, wealth inequality, for example. So what does it mean in terms of how we innovate pathways and also within the business community, how do we ensure we're creating uh, inclusive pathways to credentials, to skill sets that, again, are future-proofing not just our businesses, our enterprises, but, but enabling our people to do the same for their careers. So one of the things we're going to look at is um, just that. What are some of the new pathways? And, and we'll use PwC as a case example. By the way, the paper we did with BHEF has many, many case examples uh, of different businesses and, and approaches in the, in the hope of sparking additional uh, innovation and, and collaboration on this front. So if we could go to the, the next slide. Thank you. So this is an interesting one. We do a lot of surveying every year uh, globally and, and in the U.S. Um, among the CEO community and, and other, others in the C-suite. And you see here that obviously the, the vast majority of CEOs, and this continues to climb, 
are concerned about availability of, of skills. Uh, but, but there's also a struggle with how they deal with that. Uh, can you really make an investment in upskilling that um, gives you a return, has the desired impact? The majority of CHROs, so people in, in my role, uh, are telling us they're planning upskilling initiatives and investments. A much smaller percentage of CFOs uh, are, are saying the same thing. So there seems to be a bit of a disconnect there in the C-suite, maybe some skepticism about returns on this investment. When we survey employees, uh, the majority express concern about getting access to this. We, we believe the PwC, by the way, I was talking about a student pay down benefit as being innovative. We believe that digital upskilling is an essential employee benefit and will be viewed as such will absolutely be, be viewed as such. Uh, one of the things we do in the paper, by the way, is provide uh, BHEF research and, and from our own work, design principles about how to design an upskilling program to get the return, the benefits both for your, your people, employees, uh, but also your business. And in fact, if we could go to the, the next slide. So we'll, here, what, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to share with you the journey we've been on inside of PwC excuse me, both in the U.S. and globally. And, and so this is, um, th this slide is, it, it, you see there are two sides here, both citizen-led and business-led. Citizen-led is kind of an odd phrase in business. You don't typically hear that phrase. You're referring people as citizens. Uh, we, we started to use that phrase in 2017. Maybe it fits our, our populist moment in, in a sense, but but the idea here is that innovative, it's a, it's a simple idea, that innovative cultures are citizen-led. It's not all about top-down. And we're a, we're a firm that's over 170 years old. So a very strong culture, historically very hierarchical. And of course, as I was referencing earlier, every industry is being disrupted. And it's not simply a matter of being a startup, how do you build a true innovative culture, particularly if you're an established business? So what I want to share with you is our approach to digital upskilling. And I think it's, we've certainly found uh, this is of great interest to educators and uh, to so many of our clients who are trying to embark upon a similar journey. So we started with this focus on what we called citizen-led. We told our people that we would not leave anyone behind. We made that explicit commitment but that everyone had to opt in. And we introduced then a set of learning paths, uh, including digital badges. So digital badges are credentials that our people earn and they stay with them. Even if they leave the firm, I can post it on LinkedIn, my digital acumen knowledge badge, for example. Uh, we framed this as an agenda for everyone. So literally every single person in the firm. We asked everyone to opt in and then customize their learning path based on their particular interests. Uh, and it ranges. Some of our people were already at very advanced levels, of course. Uh, some may have PhDs in AI, uh, but others have no background at all. Uh, my colleagues, Trelisa and Scott, will share with you in a moment their journey. Uh, they both serve as a role, uh, this role of digital accelerator. So we created a competitive process we had several thousand of our people then take on a role of digital accelerator, which was a fast track role um, uh, of in-depth, more in-depth training, and then quickly being deployed back into our business to work with our clients, accelerate broader adoption uh, across our firm. Digital fitness at the top here, we actually built an app early on in, I guess, 2017. So think of your fitness app. Well, this is your digital fitness, your, your upskilling app. And by the way, we, we've made this available in higher education for free uh, for use. Uh, it's available in the, uh, the Apple, uh, the app store. So uh, this is a tool we created to help people do an immediate, a quick self-assessment and then to connect with learning assets and personalized learning pathways. So we did this early on. In a moment, I'm going to share with you kind of the 2.0 version of this tool that we're using today. 
On the right side, of course, is nothing new, business-led. So, uh, of course, this is simply a reflection of business strategy. We all have our business priorities. But what did we add to that? Uh, the digital lab. So this is a very important platform, a, a digital storefront for rapid scaling of innovation. So think in our organization, thousands of people, some may be working on the same problem, have the same pain point. They're building a bot. They're creating uh, a new approach to uh, data visualization, a tool for data visualization. Uh, but simultaneously, it's relevant to so many others. They can submit, they submit it to the, the digital lab. It's reviewed for quality. And then it's available to everyone at the firm at the same time. Gone is the hierarchy where I have to go to a supervisor and get their approval. Do they think I should do this? Um, I, we bypass all of that. And uh, anyone, everyone in the firm is empowered to contribute and expected to. But then also and we, have, we have leaderboards, there's gamification. You get recognized for contributing, but you also get recognized as uh, for, for being a consumer, for using the digital lab. So this is an important platform for, for scaling. So we're going to unpack this a bit more. If we could go to the next uh, slide, please. And uh, this is simply a graphic around global scaling. One of the key things, of course, in business is um, uh, for all of us is to be able to scale rapidly. And uh, I guess the graphic on here isn't, uh, isn't working. If it was, you'd see the, the map quickly turning red. So that's fine. Uh, but, but that's the, the point here is we, we designed scaling as an essential design component from the beginning. And this is oftentimes one of the things we see business leaders uh, wrestling with. So what I want to do is, is share with you now, I mentioned this digital fitness app. So this was a, a digital product. We're now a product company, product firm. Uh, that wasn't the case not that long ago. Uh, but one of the products we created was digital, this digital fitness app. The next version of it, 2.0, is something we call Pro Edge. Let's just, we've got a short video, one or two minutes, we'll share with you. This is a tool we're using for digital upskilling and education. Digital upskilling goes beyond skills development. It's about building a culture of continuous learning that has the power to transform your workforce. ProEdge draws on millions of data points from a wide range of labor market sources, giving you a straightforward view of how the digital skills of your workforce benchmark to your industry. ProEdge Plan analyzes that information and gives you a detailed view of skill gaps, inspects data around trending roles and skills, and then helps you deploy a custom upskilling strategy that aligns with your business goals. ProEdge integrates with your existing learning and human resource management system to help further refine individuals' learning plans. ProEdge delivers an adaptive, personalized learning experience with access to our extensive library of over 100,000 assets across 30 world-class content providers. The ProEdge Learn experience goes beyond content consumption. Learners get dynamic recommendations around new skills, courses, and even code samples, all customized to their unique learning needs and goals. Your people can track their progress in the skills that a role requires while earning valuable credentials within the platform. Specialized credentials can be earned in various functional areas. Create gives learners access to a sandbox environment where they can practice creating digital assets and demonstrate their mastery. ProEdge Share is a digital marketplace where learners distribute the digital assets they've built. This is where the value of your people's efforts scale across the enterprise. ProEdge empowers you to build the company of tomorrow today. I'm making moves. Thanks, if we could, and these are just some data points. Uh, as, as, so this is an example, the reason I wanted to share that video is it's an example of there we go. Thank you. It's an example of a tool that actually came out of our 
digital upskilling strategy, actually product development. And I think it's interesting, for, uh, certainly as we share this with educators and, and we convene uh, groups of, of educators, uh, university professors, um, and we, we hold symposia through the year and do actual upskilling for faculty as well. So from a business standpoint, sometimes business leaders wrestle with, well, just this, where do I start? Uh, where do I place the investment? So we, we actually went through this same journey, this same process, and found that it was both something we needed to do at scale for thousands, tens of thousands of people, but also needed to be personalized. And um, that the, the ProEdge product ultimately was, was something that we built in, in, as part of our own journey and as we've started to work now with, with clients. Some of the guiding principles here, uh, leadership by example. So as, as we've done digital upskilling and uh, <laughs> our, our senior most leaders, for example, participated in what we call digital academy, sitting at the table, learning how to build a box learning how to create an automation, learning how to do data visualization. Uh, so it was an inclusive agenda uh, for, for everyone in our organization. Gamification, uh, keeping it, that's something we'll, we'll describe a bit more about. And then obviously it's tied to both changing culture, but also business outcomes. And, and in fact, I'm going to go to, uh, if we go to the, the next slide, and, and I want to ask Trulisa to start here. Um, and actually, we can go to the, the next slide. So we've, we've customized the tool, so it's very personalized. But as I say, uh, one of the things we wanted to do today with you is to make this real. And uh, Trulisa, again, you're a, a director in our firm, a leader in our firm. Uh, you've also served as a digital accelerator. So maybe you could share a bit about your own journey. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, I'm a director in, at PwC, and you know the digital accelerator program. It it really is it really is a journey, and it has different levels of exposure and experience um, for for us working with technology and or you know analytics. So my background is not in data analytics. Um, I'm a CPA. You know I don't have as many master's degrees as Mike, but I have a master's. Um, but no credentials in technology re related areas at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I always had an interest in technology as it applied to my specialized area of focus. And I had designed and managed, you know, like world class intelligent tax automation solutions and robotic software similar to those that we were upskilled in or fast tracked in so the digital accelerator program for me, it's, 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 it was a selective process and I was looking forward to going deeper in, into improving the people experience, which ultimately improves the client experience, but with technology. So this program allowed me to be part of a think tank of like-minded professionals who really wanted to embrace efficiencies uh, that we were currently encouraging our clients to adopt. And so as a digital accelerator, I was connected to opportunities that would launch more um, revenue streams for the firm. It would definitely differentiate PwC in the market. And the impact was, you know, it changed who we, who we are as a firm, how we have future-proofed our professionals and how we work with business and community leaders and as well as faculty and students. So, you know, my journey was that, yes, I automated uh, upwards of 3,600 hours with 56 unique opportunities for efficiencies. And it might not seem like a lot, but 56 opportunities means that I was meeting with 56 different sets of teams of PwC professionals that were facing uh, very different issues. Uh, why, why are there slowdowns? So I was basically assessing and trying to understand their pain points so that I could apply the business and the technology um, be, being that bridge for them. I also um, have designed and stood up digital upskilling and automation programs uh, for, for our clients where this was where I actually trained uh, 1,800 of the finance professionals. So it's not just for consultants, it's also for business professionals. And then, 
you know, I've also upskilled uh, the university faculty and it changes the way that we interact with faculty university as well as the students, making sure that students are day one ready. And ultimately, you know, the, the return on the investment of digital upskilling and the the diversity that comes with it. Our teams were much more diverse. It was more a uh, cross business line of service focus from a, a one firm perspective, so to speak. And, um, you know, earning the badges was was fun. It, it kept, you know, the wheels turning in a different way. There was nothing stagnant about what we were doing. We were really making a big change. And, you know, the ROI, you know, one of my clients, uh, they saved 12,000 hours. They attended a two-day digital academy. Um, my team and I upskilled them. We went through innovation labs and we were able to identify 12,000 hours of savings. And within one week of hosting office hours and working with them one-on-one -on -one in these very, you know, in a, in a citizen-led approach, within, within a month, they had already saved 1,000 hours. So very impressive work. Um, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily have technology backgrounds, but we are able to, um, you know, fast track ourselves future proof where we are. Um, so, you know, Mike, if we take a look at the next slide, I think we can bring it to life just a little bit. And just seeing how, you know, self-service data analytics are, it's really automating time consuming data from spreadsheets. In this example here, we were quickly able to operationalize new ways of working with uh, management approaches that best transform previously manually calculated um, and and analysis from spreadsheets to everything being 100% directly automated, which increased the value of the services and the focus that the client was preparing, as well as answering those high quality and high priority questions relevant to key stakeholders versus, you know, scrumming through and trying to sort through data. So for me, this journey is um, still ongoing. I don't think I could ever let it go because I do want to continue to share the excitement that we've been able to hone in at PwC. Thank you, uh, Trulisa. And for the educators who are joining us today, the, the badges that Trulisa has earned. So one of the things we're looking at is how do we collaborate with academic institutions so that those become credit, uh, attached to credit, academic credit. And, and then they're stackable into certificates as well that have value in a specific industry. That's what the ProEdge platform that I was describing earlier enables uh, learners to do. And we've, we've seen a tremendous uptick. It's reflected. I know there's been a dramatic increase, for example, in enrollment in certificate granting programs broadly in our economy. You think about the mega trends we were talking about earlier, uh, student debt and the like. And the fast, the, the, just the, the pace of change in our economy and in business today. So, so those sorts of certificates that are uh, highly relevant, market valued by the marketplace, can open doors in a career. Um, and Trulisa, thank you. Great example as well of so an accelerator firm is a leader driving a broader cultural adoption, uh, new ways of working. So. Uh, and thank you for your work with faculty as well, I'll say. Uh, so Scott, maybe just a, if you want to just share your own, uh, your own story. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. And uh, truly is an honor being here with both of you as well. And um, so my story, if we flip to the next slide, um, I too did not have a technology background. Uh, and to add some you know, kind of uh, background to that, I went to Lehigh University and I think the most technology I experienced was outside of Microsoft Excel was uh, Microsoft Access. Um, and I took an accounting information systems class and I was sitting there thinking, wow, if this is the technology I have to use, I am in trouble. <laughs> um, I was in over my head and I was like, what's going on? Um, so when I started at PwC, um, you know, I was like, okay, we're using Excel. This is good. We're not using um, Microsoft Access. Like, I'll be okay. Um, I started taking down notes. I started back in 2015. Um, I only got one master's. So Mike, I, I will have to take that challenge and get a few more. Um, but 
what happened is I started in 2015, uh, quickly got upskilled on Excel by just uh, talking to my peers, using it on a daily, daily basis, watching YouTube videos. Um, and I started taking down sticky notes, ideas of uh, things that I thought were inefficient or repetitive or mundane. Um, and you might have thought, like, if you walk by my desk, it would have looked like a beautiful mind. I, you know, writing all over the walls and it looked crazy. Um, but it was all things that I wanted to come back to when I had time to figure out how to do it more efficiently. Um, and then one of my directors challenged me and said, OK, now I want you to go actually, you know, act on it actually implement something to make it more efficient. So um, lo and behold, an industry uh, accounting uh, that had not experienced a ton of innovation outside of Excel, all of a sudden there was a plethora of citizen-led uh, technology platforms or tools for us to use. And what I did is I latched onto a couple of them, started watching YouTube videos, started using them and within just a couple weeks. And I wanna emphasize that literally a couple weeks, I had learned a completely new skill set and was applying it and showing that I could actually add real value right off the bat. And what I realized was um, I couldn't just keep this knowledge to myself. I had to share this knowledge. So um, still being a novice, I went out and started teaching everybody everything that I knew. And it actually furthered my knowledge um, and, and made me more uh, of an advanced user over time because I was pushing myself to be uncomfortable with change and learning you know, more advanced concept, concepts because everybody was demanding to learn the next step in the process, how to continue their upskilling. So ultimately I ended up upskilling or training about 3000 plus of our employees, kind of starting at the bottom there of my, my little deck, um, because I think that's something that I think is hugely, hugely, hugely important, um, especially in a, a digital era is upskilling, uh, upskilling and training and sharing knowledge across the community. Um, I've also helped develop over 60 plus assets um, that Mike was talking about on our digital lab and help share those across to, to our network. Um, and why that's really, really important is because we have created this opportunity to break down a typical uh, barrier of communication be between our lines of services. And we've enabled our people to just talk about problems and solutions. And I'm able to work with Trilisa, who might work in a different business unit and talk to her about how to solve the problem that she's facing. While I might not have any background on what it is that she actually does. So I think that's really, really empowering. And um, another thing to that point was um, when the digital accelerator program came around just a couple of years ago, that made it so that we could pull out about 3000 plus of our employees and have them focus more holistically uh, their time and efforts on doing exactly this, training them up uh, on new skill sets at basically operation warp speed, getting everybody up to speed as quick as possible, and then getting them back into the markets and spreading this across the markets. And, um, you know, I can say firsthand the energy was second to none. People were so hey. energetic. And Scott, why don't we show, let's show that digital, I think we've got a visualization example yeah. because I think it's really, it's quite yeah. relevant for, for educators as well. These are tools that, by the yeah. way, many of the licenses are free to students mm -hmm. that can really differentiate your graduates uh, yeah. on day one. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. So, you know, I label this slide kind of from Excel to analytics and enabling your data to tell a story. Um, on the left, you have your traditional Excel file, which for us was our, our charity um, report. Um, we basically were just using it as a, a model to show, you know, okay, if we were to pull out a mock data set that was tens of thousands of rows of information and we wanted to uh, try to dr drive some analytics from it, how would we do that in Excel? And you know, we quickly found that we could run a bunch of pivot tables and just get down to a summarized answer but it didn't necessarily give us all the answers to all the questions that we um, would think to ask. And it also didn't help us think of questions to ask. Whereas on the right-hand side, we push to a visualization and you're able to drive into, in a more detail, some of those questions and figure out, you know, some opportunities. And Mark, you know, one of, one of the things I've observed as we speak with faculty is no different than in business. Um, 
some people have just they've been using a particular tool, particular ways of doing things. They're uncomfortable changing. And where we've seen schools, universities really distinguish themselves is through that interdisciplinary collaboration and, and, and faculty where, where technology infuses the curriculum almost irrespective of the, of the discipline. Uh, there are opportunities, um, there are opportunities for, uh, uh, for that sort of innovation. And it really, I think, is something that the students benefit from. So, so thank you, Scott. And, and just mindful of time here, maybe we'll, uh, I'll just say a few more words and we'll, we'll pause then for, uh, for questions. So if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So, so just some lessons learned here. Um, we, we've tried to share a, a quick, short case study of PwC, our journey around digital upskilling, part of a broader agenda around digital, digital transformation. Now, this is a firm that already has a large technology consulting practice, a strategy practice, um, but this was an agenda that cut across everything, both our, all of our operations, how we deliver services, but then fundamentally creating some new pathways for our people to earn credentials that, and, and also with rapid application. So they're earning a credential, but they're structured rapid application for, uh, for real impact and value for our, our clients and our, and our firm. Uh, I mentioned if we go to the next slide as well, uh, the thread, we started the, the conversation here this afternoon uh, with talking also about the imperative of inclusion and building an inclusive economy, an inclusive society, uh, given some of the, the gaps we were talking about in the ADAPT framework. Uh, the asymmetry, for example, in, in wealth and income inequality and so on. Um, so as a firm, this is a very important agenda to us. Uh, in 2019, we made a, a global $3 billion commitment. Um, just a few days ago, we announced a new $125 million commitment in the U.S. Uh, that will include digital upskilling, that will include uh, faculty training as well. We go to the, the next slide. And uh, I know, Mark, I think we're going to send out the link to the, to the report so everyone will have access and we'll include some links to other information here if you want more information around, for example, the lessons learned that we share on our, uh, our upskilling journey. Uh, we'll, we'll share that with you as well. And, and the last thing I'll mention before we close is CEO action. Um, uh, if we could go to the, the final slide here, bringing it together. Uh, this is a forum that uh, CEO, uh, that PwC was actually one of the, uh, was the founding uh, co-sponsor of in 2017. It, it's quickly become the largest CEO coalition. We have over 2,000 CEOs, um, university leaders who are participating. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is it's also a forum for sharing best practices. So that includes, for example, um, investing in the community, building talent pipelines. Um, that includes the digital upskilling agenda, uh, both inside uh, of our firm, but also more broadly how we're investing in our, in our community. So this is a forum that's, that's open to all. There's no, no fee. Uh, you can go to ceoaction.com uh, and you get direct access to, um, to those practices. So I wanted to highlight that as well. So, so, Mark, why don't I, uh, I'll pause here. And thank you to, to Trulisa and Scott as well. Well, I add my thanks to Trulisa, Scott, and Mike. Uh, what a great framework. What a great set of examples. Um, we've got eight or nine questions that have come in, and I'd like to um, uh, frame them uh, and, and start. And, boy, there's so many different ways to go, go at them. Um, so uh, I heard a number of different things uh, throughout this talk. Uh, you use terms such as future proof. Um, you talked about transformation, whether it's around the self or organizations, um, taking things to scale. Uh, obviously, the phrase digital upskilling is throughout this. One phrase that really caught uh, me, and, and I think it's important as it applies to higher ed, Mike, you talked about your, your um, colleague who, who reached out to you today and with the phrase, and I'm paraphrasing if I don't get this uh, exactly right, um, your business is in trouble. You just haven't realized it yet. 
Um, yeah. I think that in higher ed, that oftentimes can be the case as well. Um, our sector has been in trouble for some time. If you just look at the financials, um, but we just haven't always realized it as, as significantly. Um, so it's a lot of catch up. So it's in that context um, that one question that came in was um, you talk about upskilling a lot. Does that just apply to the traditional um, business engineering, data science types of fields? Um, but could it, could it also, or should it also be something that we think of across our curriculum for all areas in higher ed? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Mark. And I, I really believe there are aspects of this agenda, this curriculum that apply regardless of major. Um, uh, the paper that, that we'll send the link out to, we did a lot of research. So PwC did a lot of research. We did some in conjunction um, with the World Economic Forum. And uh, so we share illustrations, for example, of what we found in terms of declining um, and increasing uh, roles in business. In, in fact, the ProEdge platform is designed to uh, help people bridge, make that, make that, build a bridge, literally a skill bridge to a future role. We know that there's a lot of creative destruction inherent, of course, in capitalism, but that has become, the pace of that uh, ha has, has accelerated so greatly, so significantly with this uh, fourth industrial revolution, with the increasing application of technology across all organizations, really. So, so I think this is an important agenda. And by the way, it's, we, we've talked, we've given some examples, some simple examples, data visualization, uh, building bots, building, uh, in a autom in a driving automation uh, of work and the like. But, but it's also, for example, we, we spend a lot of time training around design thinking, human centered design and, uh, and building the, what, what are some refer to as soft skills, but we call them power skills, uh, communication, uh, relationship skills, empathy, uh, the ability to uh, effectively collaborate and, and work in a team to lead a team and the like. So, so I think we, we've tried to take a very holistic approach and, and I think it does apply across, um, across disciplines. So, uh, I'll offer a reflection, and that's kind of a transition to our next question. My instinct is uh, identical to yours. When we first announced our Data Science Institute with Northwestern Mutual and Marquette University, we had faculty, when we talked about a call for the initial interest from every single discipline, and they all came forward and said, whether you're an anthropologist, an art historian, yeah. a nurse, yeah. name the field, I'm a data scientist. I mean, that's just this, this overwhelming sentiment. And I think for all those fields, it's absolutely true in the world that we're in today. So it's in that context that I think about one of the questions that, that uh, came in. Uh, what advice do you have to students in terms of combining a liberal arts education with strong technical knowledge? So Mike, I'm gonna put a little sharper point on this. Going back to Mike Fenlon in the 1980s, you have studied, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the, the major was comparative study of religion. Would you go down that same path today or would you bundle it with, you know, you know, talking about yeah. the upscaling, talking about data, you know, analytics and visualization? Help me with how you would advise students today. Yeah, well, certainly when I was a student, there were no cell phones. Um, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing here today, obviously. Uh, so and that's just that's partly the point that all of us are born in one generation and have to learn to adapt to, to another. All, that, that's true for all of us, uh, including the digital natives, um, uh, my kids, uh, your, your kids. So I think this agenda of lifelong learning, number one, maybe that's been a cliche in the past. Today, it's an imperative. It's an absolute imperative. And our pathways are not all set up to support that. Um, you know, traditional models where I go off for four years, I earn a degree, and I'm done, quote, unquote. Right. And, and maybe I go on to graduate school or something like that. But but the point is, and, and this is what we've tried to share today. Uh, badges, cred credential based, shorter, more focused. So, no, what I go back and say, oh, no, I'm going to be a computer science major. I think we, there was a school of computer science at that time for sure. But, you know, I wouldn't do that. But you don't need to either. I think that there's a the liberal arts are extraordinarily important. 
but they're not at odds. You can combine that with other. So if you if you want to learn how to make a persuasive argument to influence others, you've got to know how to use data and present data. Uh, so if you're in political science, uh, re regardless of your of your discipline, those are skills that I think are relevant um, in any occupation, in any career path that you select. And you know, just the the visualization tools we shared we, very briefly here today are. I think a good illustration that are relevant. Um, uh, maybe you're doing, maybe you're studying comparative literature and you're doing analysis of texts. Uh, and I think there's a lot of different applications, and and some of that innovation occurs when when faculty from different disciplines spend time with each other uh, and collaborate. Terrific. So I'm going to take it up a notch and think about this in the context of something that when we first met. Uh, we had conversations about this, and I think this is one of the powerful opportunities uh, to hear your perspectives. Uh, and it really uh, talks about the role of higher education today in terms of solving uh, this educational need. Uh, many individuals, many uh, on this call, many of our faculty, and certainly uh, folks who we work with uh, in industry, and we've got industry well represented on this call today, uh, they point out that, that um, there's a significant uh, uh, technology outdatedness, this, this concept that, that uh, we're quite behind. In fact, uh, uh, one of the participants on the call today is Todd McLeese. He's got a firm and, and, and his research and others shows that, that employees today are, are probably 50% uh, globally technologically obsolete or certainly insufficient with respect to the needs that are there. But employers and employees alike can't go back and get that master's degree. They can't go back and get another undergraduate degree. They don't have time and, and, and employers right. don't have the resources. So these certificates and the credentials and badges, um, that's hugely important. And Mike, you pointed out a model where, boy, if they can have the credit built in, and that is the coin of the realm in higher ed, but help me with what you think the best case or best practices are for universities that you're working with today that might stand back and historically say, well, our business is about degrees and let third party yeah. providers or let industry deal with that. Help me with bridging that gap. Yeah. So um, it, it, that's such a great question, uh, Mark, because I think none of us uh, are outside of this, uh, the disruption that's coming across our world today driven in part certainly by technology. Uh, it's transforming everything. So none of us can take a hall pass on that and say, well, so, so you can either be fearful and uh, try and protect the status quo, or uh, after all, it is an, an imperative that we all evolve. And, and it's, the, it's true, I think, in every institution. It's a matter of survival, but it's also extraordinary, there's extraordinary opportunity here. And it goes back to what, what's your purpose? I mean, truly, what is your mission? Is the purpose to do things one way forever? Is that the purpose? I don't think so. And, and if we look at the purpose of higher education in our society, so foundational, so fundamental, so critical uh, to, to building a successful market economy, uh, an inclusive economy, so many implications here for policymakers as well, by the way, in building those sorts of ecosystems, creating that magnet for talent and jobs. So, so I don't think anyone gets a hall pass, but, but the, the point is to embrace this as an opportunity. And, and I think educators are, are no different than business people in that regard. Uh, I, I would go back to fundamental purpose and staying true to that. And that innovation has got to be, um, it, it, it is absolutely essential in fulfilling your purpose, whether that's in business or, or in higher education. And concretely, we've shared some examples with how we have innovated. The, the ProEdge tool is an example of that, that we built for just to personalize learning, to make it relevant, to make it customized, to, to make it fast as well, um, accessible. Um, and, and ultimately, our vision is uh, creating these pathways that, you know, can lead to not just certificates, but also degrees over time and rethinking a frame of, of, of learning to say, what, what does it mean it, to be in a world and an economy that, that demands true lifelong learning, not just reading, not just, you know, pursuing things that might be of interest, 
But if I'm going to maintain my relevance, if I'm going to future proof my career, um, I've got to engage in that kind of lifelong learning, developing new skills, uh, attaining new credentials. Terrific. You know, we've got five minutes left. I just got the warning. Might have time for a couple more questions um, that, that I hope we can get in. I know I've got many more questions that have come in, but, but let me um, go with something that I know is personally important to you, professionally, but also uh, from PricewaterhouseCoopers, organizationally important. Similarly, at UWM, it's vitally important too. We are in a state, uh, Wisconsin, that has um, the most significant high school achievement gap uh, between black and white students in the country. It's 50th out of 50. 43rd uh, worst gap for Hispanic versus white. That gap continues um, in terms of, of uh, post-secondary education. And it also is something that we've left a lot of people behind, the access to education. Um, can we use a lot of the skills, can we use the tools that you've talked about today to help address um, whether you want to talk about, well, yeah, there's also the digital divide, but fundamentally, um, as we seek to become a region of choice and as an access university that prides itself on diversity, equity, and inclusion with the most diverse undergraduate um, student profile, can we use some of the tools and the implications for what you're seeing both within Price Waterhouse Cooper, but especially, Mike, I think about the worlds that you uh, cross and the boundaries you stand. What are your thoughts on UWM's role and the use of technology? Yeah, thank you for that question, Mark. Uh, I think absolutely uh, this is a shared responsibility we all have uh, in building a more inclusive economy and a more inclusive society. Uh, so, and can technology, can digital upskilling play a role? Absolutely. This is part of something we call Achieve Your Potential. It's a set of commitments we've made over many years now, including investments in um, secondary education, teacher training, uh, but also faculty training. So, so I, I think it's, uh, it's an imperative for all of us. And it goes to that discussion we were talking about in terms of how we define our purpose. Our purpose, well, our purpose as business people, as leaders, as educators, uh, and and I think we have a, a shared responsibility to to make that investment. It's essential for the success of our businesses. If I think about Milwaukee as a as an ecosystem, a talent ecosystem, competing, literally competing, where is talent going to migrate? Where are the opportunities? Uh, it, it's an absolute imperative. You can apply the same thing to us uh, as a society, as a, as a country, obviously, um, uh, on a global scale. So I, I think UWM has such an extraordinarily important role to play here. Uh, so many of the challenges we face being an urban in, uh, institution uh, with a research agenda, uh, solving solving problems, building trust. That's how, by the way, that's how we often think about our purpose at PwC. So uh, solving some of the most complex problems, building trust in our society through those sorts of um, investments, enabling people to control their own destinies uh, and, and be participants sharing the benefits of this digital economy. So it takes, I think it takes collaboration, business leaders, leaders in higher ed, policymakers. Uh, there's a shared agenda here in a world where sometimes it seems it's, it's hard to get things done and to collaborate. There, this is a shared agenda. So I think it's essential for, for UWM. And by the way, I'll, I'll thank you publicly for your, your leadership, uh, which is very inspiring to me. So thank you. Well, Mike, thank you so much. And with our time remaining, what I'm gonna do is rather than use, there's some specific questions about this link or that survey or other things that you refer to, I'm gonna yeah. turn the corner and basically just affirm with you that um, we'll send follow-up links um, to what you've described, um, the paper itself the, that you wrote with Brian. Um, we'll make sure that we include all the links to surveys and, and uh, uh, the types of apps and, and the tools. Um, but I also think just in that same context, there's some real economies to what you just described. When we talk about serving historically underserved populations, you know, this issue of accessibility is critically important because even as a public institution, our price point uh, today is, is, is well beyond the means of a lot of individuals. So um, you're speaking to that is, is very helpful. And I know we share that. Um, Mike, this is, this is something, th this is a wonderful way to showcase 
uh, just your your status, your um, uh, technology knowledge, um, your your conscience uh, with respect to to really doing the right things and, and helping us think about curriculum, thinking about um, how we prepare the workforce for the future. Um, you're on both sides of it uh, with your time in higher ed, your time in industry. Uh, you really see how the pieces fit together. So you're a true visionary. Uh, we benefited a lot. I know we could spend all afternoon talking about questions uh, and look forward to having you back. I know you're a Wisconsinite with roots. And so we look forward to doing this in person, bundling this perhaps when you come in for one of those Packer games or some of those other opportunities <laughs> for you to visit your family. I don't know if you have any final comments, but I want to make sure I, I, I offer huge thanks to you, to Lisa and Scott. Yeah, th thanks so much, uh, Mark, to you and, and, and the team. Um, we're delighted and honored to to join everyone today. And uh, uh, again, thank you for your leadership. The university, has, uh, UWM, has such a an extraordinarily important mission. So we're we're proud to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for Lisa. Okay. Thank bye, so bye, much. everybody. Thank you Have for joining day. us today. Thank Great you. Great program.